Hi everyone and thank you for joining me this afternoon for this webinar on using attachment aware and trauma-informed practices to support children and young people. Um, I'm very grateful to Anne, Sarah and Nicole and the rest of the team for giving me the opportunity to speak this afternoon and I hope you find the webinar really informative. Um, I'm going to touch on very briefly on a little bit of what I've come across in my practice but there's so much more out there that I'd encourage you to go and explore afterwards. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask them using the Q&A function at the bottom, and I will do my best to try and answer them at the end. So just to introduce myself, I'm Zita Mew, and I'm an aspiring educational psychologist, and I'm currently a teaching assistant at a primary school. And during the past academic year, I've had particular focus on delivering interventions across Key Stage 1, but I've also had experience working in Key Stage 2 and volunteering with Key Stage 3 and 4 pupils. So I'm just briefly going to run through what I hope to cover during a webinar. So I'm firstly going to talk a little bit about how I came across this topic and why I found it to be really useful in my practice. Then I'll discuss using attachment aware trauma informed practices on an individual level through the role of a key adult. And then on more of a whole school level approach using the idea of pace. And then finally, I'm going to say a little something about how we might be able to use these attachment aware and trauma informed practices in light of our current situation of COVID-19. And then hopefully we'll have some time some questions at the end and like I said if you've got any just pop them on the Q&A function at the bottom and I'll try and answer them. So being attachment aware and trauma informed is something that I've really seen the value in while supporting looked after children and other vulnerable children and young people who may have experienced trauma and attachment difficulties. So when I was first asked to be a key adult for a looked after child I felt that I was going in a bit blind. So I knew theories of attachment and I'd read some of the research on the effects of trauma on children and young people. So I'd say I was probably quite attachment aware, but I wasn't really trauma informed. And most importantly, I didn't feel that I knew how I was supposed to use what I did know to create effective change in the classroom, particularly with the time constraints on practicalities of being a teaching assistant in the busy school. So once I'd become a bit more attachment aware and trauma informed and was able to use some of these practices, I felt a lot clearer in my understanding of what my role was and in supporting these children and young people and what the outcomes were for these children and young people that I was supporting. So in terms of being a key adult, so being a key adult provides support to vulnerable children and young people on an individual level where you're working with that child often, but not necessarily on a one to one basis. So in my experience, I've been a key adult to a child who was actually in my class. So I had to manage doing that alongside being the general class TA and supporting other children, and young people in that class. But I've also been a key adult for a child who wasn't in my class and that involved having maybe three or four check-in sessions that lasted about 10 to 15 minutes each day at different points during the day and also supporting that child or young person at break times and lunch times and so even if you're not with that particular child all day it's really important that you make sure that when you are with them you're trying to do all of these things so attending to their attachment system in the school setting and providing a secure attachment base um, being consistent, reliable, empathic and attuned to the child and young person you're working with, modelling healthy and appropriate responses to both positive and negative situations which they may often have not had experience of, facilitating effective solutions and advocating for that child or young person as much as you can. So those are the key aspects but there are many other little parts that come along with that too. In terms of thinking about the outcomes that that key adult would have for that child they're supporting, some of the difficulties that these vulnerable children and young people may show include difficulty forming trusting relationships with adults and peers, 
managing feelings such as shame, anxiety and anger and having low self-esteem as a result. So there may be other difficulties away from attachment, such as executive functioning and attention and issues with transitions. But in terms of attachment, um, having a key adult alongside them, the hope for them are that these outcomes, which are based on Ainsworth's caregiving dimensions. So being, having them being experienced and being emotionally and physically available which develops that trust element, managing their feelings by receiving the sensitivity of response from that key adult who will attune themselves to their key child, developing an increased sense of self-esteem by experiencing acceptance and feeling effective by being engaged in relationships with both adults and peers. So that those were the main outcomes that as a key adult, I was trying to achieve when supporting a child young person. So that was supporting the child young person on more of an individual level. And the PACE approach is one that I feel, a way which I feel that the attachment aware trauma informed practice can be applied on more of a whole school level. And it's based on the work of Dan Hughes. So it's definitely something that as a key adult you should be using. It's something that I did use. But I think it's also really powerful to use across the board with children and young people. And so PACE is a way of thinking, feeling and essentially communicating which supports children and young people to feel safe and to build trust in relationships and really empower those around the child, I think. So it can be used in your language verbally and also your body language. So PACE stands for playfulness, acceptance, curiosity and empathy. And I'll go through what we mean by each of these. So in terms of playfulness, that's allowing yourself to smile and laugh and play and essentially be a big kid. Um, you might need to let yourself go a little, but you'll be quite surprised by how naturally it does come and how well children and young people respond to it and how enjoyable it is. I guess, you know, it does release dopamine, oxytocin. So it's, it's, it's a great thing, really. Um, the more shared joy that you can have with a child or young person, the better. And for children and young people who often struggle to form relationships and have interactions with their peers, it's really important that they still get these playful interactions, even if they might be with an adult. Um, it's about communicating your delight in just being in their company and balancing the tensions and anxieties that these children and young people often feel. So in terms of what you could say in your verbal language, it might just be reacting, you know, no way to something that they've said that's really excited you um, and in terms of your body language just being quite animated really so you know wide mouth to show your shock or amazement at something making gestures with your hands it might be a high five um, and then just maybe putting on a little silly voice when you're interacting with them so in terms of acceptance that is where you are really trying to show that child or young person that you understand what they are saying and what they're trying to communicate, especially through their behavior. And it's really important that you might not agree with their behavior, but that that child feels heard in what they're trying to express. So it's about active listening. So their behavior or their actions might be right or wrong, but their way they're feeling is right to them. So it's about holding that child or young person in an unconditional positive regard as much as you can, even when something quite negative has happened. Um, it comes back to that advocating part of being a key adult, just advocating them whenever you can. Um, and so your possible language that you might want to use is something like, now I understand you know, why you're feeling like this, or I see now why you decided to do that. And then the curiosity aspect is about waiting, watching, I'm wondering and doing these things out loud, noticing and wondering out loud to the child or young person you're working with. So, you know, I want, I can see you're smiling. I wonder if that's because you're feeling happy because you were chosen to answer a question and you got the question right. Equally, if they're feeling a little bit down, you know, I notice you're feeling a little bit down. Is that maybe because there's a new teacher in the class today and you're not quite sure what to make of them? And then just generally being curious about what's happening in their world. So just tell me about this and let them control that, let them speak and tell you all the things they want to tell you about. 
And in terms of empathy, it's really crucial to try and top up children and young people with empathy at any opportunity that you can. So the more empathy that we can give out to these children and young people, the more that they can receive and the more likely they are to pass this on to other people. And being attuned is the foundation for empathy. So your body language might be trying to mirror the expression on your face that the child's experiencing. So, you know, if they're telling you something really positive, you know, putting yourself in that position that you were telling that story or that thing and mirroring that in your facial expression. And in terms of your language, you know, I can see how whatever they're telling you positive or negative would make you feel, or I imagine that incident or that situation was quite difficult and upsetting. So that's the PACE model. And then I thought that I'd lastly touch on how we can think about the attachment aware and trauma informed practices that we have and how they can be applied in light of our current situation of COVID-19. So with so much uncertainty at the moment, once children and young people are back at school, they're really going to need to feel safe and secure. And COVID-19 has been a trauma in many ways for children and young people, and they're bound to be feeling anxious and vulnerable. And for those experiencing trauma, trust is going to be one of the biggest asks for when they come back to school. And if nothing else, as adults working and supporting with these vulnerable children and young people, it's really important, if nothing else, we show compassion and kindness, um, endless patience, understanding and sensitivity. And it's about giving children and young people responses that they haven't maybe been shown and for the ones that have been lucky enough to be shown these responses, it's about topping them up so they that can continue to experience that. And we can take it for granted that the children and young people who have coped quite well being away from school are going to cope well adjusting back to school. But actually, they may need some support with that as well. And, you know, it's about using pace in that light as much as possible to get to understand and build that trust with those children and young people as they come back to school. And children may be feeling quite insecure in their relationships and attachments. So for some children and young people, they might be worried about having to rebuild relationships and attachments with peers and adults at school. And for others who have felt very secure at home, the school environment may now be perceived as quite uncertain and maybe not as safe as it used to be. So it's about ensuring that it's safe for all children and young people on their return. Um, being attuned to these children and young people is really important and attunement is all about how we can tune in to read and then respond to a child or young person's needs at any given time and again lots of children and young people may not have had experience and exposure to being around a lots of attuned adults during this time and then again equally those who might be lucky enough to have been around these attuned adults will need this to be continued once they're back at school it's really important to try and be in the moment. So making sure that these children and young people's experiences of their time away from school or COVID-19 is fully seen and heard. They're going to have lots to say about their experiences of such an uncertain time. And it's really important we give them that space and that opportunity to share and really listen and hear and validate their experiences. So Louise Bomber mentions six areas that require special attention in children and young people who have experienced numerous adverse childhood experiences and relational trauma. And as we were saying that COVID is a trauma, and this is also relevant. So those six elements are relationships with others, nutrition, sleep, mindfulness, breathing and exercise. And they all feed into our overall mental health. So depending on your role of how you support children and young people, you'll have more, you'll be able to have more of a direct impact on some more than others. But it's really important that everyone has an awareness of these and can promote these to children, young people, their families and everyone else supporting them. So finally, this is an image from the front cover of Louise Bomber's latest book, Know Me to Teach Me. It came out a few months ago and Although she didn't write it with COVID in mind, there's really a lot of relevance um, 
in the book and it's really pertinent in reconnecting and rebuilding the relationships with our most vulnerable children and young people in light of what has been happening. So Beaumont talks about a cycle of relate, re regulation, relate, reason and repair when working with traumatised children and young people in crisis. So I'm just going to go through briefly all the parts of that cycle. So in terms of relate, that's about really helping the child and young person to understand what's going on inside themselves and to help them regulate their own levels of stress. And lots of children, young people will be coming back feeling quite anxious and quite stressed, having not been at school for very long. Um, and so it's really important that we help them to be able to calm themselves and try to do this when it's a time calm, when it's a calm time. So helping children, young people to be in a calm state and notice what they notice about themselves when they're calm so they can regain self-control. Um, one way of doing this might be calming sensory breaks, so whether that might be, you know, going around the school for five or ten minutes doing a few jobs to help them calm and re-regulate themselves. So when you're regulating together with a child or young person, you're teaching them that it's possible to shift their state of anxiety or stress and their feelings by engaging something on a sensory level. In terms of relating, this is really a way of connecting and understanding the inner world of the child or young person. And we really need to try and focus on their hidden needs as well as some of their overt needs. So there's probably going to be an increased amount of hidden needs as a result of COVID-19. And some children and young people may not be overtly displaying any anxiety or stress, but hidden beneath, they may be feeling quite anxious and stressed. And that's maybe where the playfulness or empathy side of the PACE approach might be really helpful to get to understand what's going on for them. So by relating to a child and young person through quality moments, we're really teaching them and stressing to them the importance of these connections and relationships, which is going to be vitally important in returning to school. When we reach the reasoning stage of the cycle, um, children and young people are now ready to learn, which going through the regulate and relate stage and getting to the reasoning part shows real resilience to the trauma that they've experienced. So it's helping them to realize that they can make choices that matter and that they can impact their world in positive ways. And that includes being able to learn. And so by reasoning together with a child or young person, we're really teaching them to be able to pause, reflect, and engage their high level thinking and cognitive brain in order to be able to learn. And then finally, the repair stage, there will be times when using these practices are going to be challenging and difficult, and there might be bumps in the road. And as adults, we never had to respond to a crisis like COVID-19 before. And even for those children and young people who've, who have experienced trauma, they will never have experienced a trauma like COVID-19. So it's about, as an adult, apologising to the child young person if necessary, admit that you could have done something a bit differently and repair your relationship if need be as a way of reconnecting with the child or young person. And so when we're repairing the relationship with the child or young person, we're giving them the hopeful message that we can often put things right and that often difficult situations make us stronger and really what better message to send to them in such a difficult time that we've all been going through. So that brings to the end what I wanted to say today about using attachment aware and trauma informed practices to support children and young people. So I'm going to open it up to any questions and I'm just going to stop sharing now. Okay, so got a question here that says have I come across any challenges when putting these strategies into practice? It's a really good question. Um, so yeah, so in terms of being a key adult, I think it's really important to remember where you've started with that child or young person and where you're heading. So if you're supporting a child or young person that has had difficulties in forming trust in relationships, then as a key adult trying to form a trusting relationship yourself, that might take a lot of time and can be quite difficult. And equally, once you've formed 
a trusting relationship. There'll be times when a child or young person can be really warm and loving one minute and then push you away the next. And I guess in those moments that's happened to me, um, they're almost testing you, aren't they? To see, you know, are you as reliable as you claim to be? So it is about remaining reliable and consistent and remembering how much that they've already overcome to get to that point and the support that you've already given them in achieving that. But equally, at the same time, it's about being kind to yourself, you know, knowing that it isn't personal that they're pushing you away and making sure that you've got those support systems both professionally and personally in, in place. And um, I guess with pace, it can be quite hard to adopt pace in every interaction that you might want to. So I can think of examples where I've had to deal with a really difficult or stressful situation in the classroom or playground and then go in with my go into my key child to check up on them and try and use elements of pace such as being placeful and you might not really be in the mind frame to do that so you really have to try and be in the moment as much as you can as I touched on earlier um, and your focus has to become that child and your interaction with them so I would say take a few minutes before going into that interaction if you don't think that you can fully be in that moment and you know equally in some instances share how you're feeling with that child when you go in and interact with them you know they might be able to show you some of that empathy that you've been topping up to them and then you know equally there might be instances where someone working with a child or young person say has been called a name or something by a child and in that moment the person's going to be quite annoyed and pace is going to be the last thing on their mind to use so again I'd say compose yourself and you know be honest with yourself do you think you're able to go and use pace to understand that young person in that moment? And if the answer is no, you know, be honest with yourself and there's a strength in that and then you know, maybe pass it on to another colleague that you are confident might be able to use um, pace more effectively than you can at that point. And again, that support of your colleagues um, is really vital. So I think those were the two main challenges I'd say I've come across so far. So thank you for that question. Um, another questions asking are there any other readings that I that I'm, I might recommend in expanding understanding of trauma informed attachment aware practice and um, that's a really good question and I would say I would recommend starting where I started which was with Louise Bomber so she's got a fantastic she's got lots of amazing books and she's got a fantastic book called Inside I'm Hurting which provides lots of practical strategies to support children and young people who have experienced trauma whilst making reference to theories of attachment and as I mentioned before um, she's also got a five book series of books on schools becoming more attachment aware the little little pocket sized um, books um, and those books are really useful in supporting schools and becoming more attachment aware through the perspectives of different adults that support a child or young person, including so this one I've got here is the key adult, but there are also books that support the class teacher, um, SENCO and parents and carers. Um, and then following on from that, the work of Dan Hughes, Kim Golding and Bruce Perry that Louise um, references in a lot of her books are also great places to start. And there are also some great websites out there that have resources such as Beacon House, the Anna Freud Centre website and Your Mind. So that's just a small starting place. You know, I've still got lots to learn. Um, yeah, so that's where I would start. Thank you for that question. Um, someone's just asking me to go through those six areas of special attention again. So they were breathing, exercise, relationship with others, mindfulness, nutrition. I got those five, is that, is that six? So those were the six, but I'll, the webinar will be available afterwards. So if you want to go through those again, I would have mentioned those. Let me see if I've got any other questions. So I've got a really interesting question here about how if how I've been able to maintain 
these relationships virtually during lockdown and any benefits or difficulties that I might have recognised? Um, so that's a really interesting question. Um, so I have managed to maintain a bit of a relationship with a key child through lockdown, um, both virtually through um, some calls and then also through supporting that child. So that child is going to find it quite difficult to come back to school. And so they've not been, they haven't returned to school, even though the rest of their class has um, during lockdown, just because it's quite a difficult situation to manage. But we've actually been able to facilitate that child coming into school a couple of times when we've had very little children in the building so they can be able to explore how the school environment has changed. And I think it's been really valuable and even more crucial to use um, the PACE approach during this time to find out what they've been doing at home during lockdown, um, how they've been feeling um, about both not being at school, but also returning to school. And, you know, they've had the same sort of, they've had the same people around them for the whole of lockdown. So having the sort of different person, they were to tap into what they've been doing in a different way um, has been, I think, really useful for both me and that child. Um, yeah, so those are my thoughts really on that. So thank you for that question. Um, so I've got a good question here about, are there any prerequisites or expectations to becoming a key adult? And what are the expectations of being a key adult? Um, so Louise, this book by Louise Bomber goes through lots of handy tips. Um, in terms of the right person to be a key adult, um, I think that's about really about someone who can, first and foremost, I guess, deliver pace quite naturally. So someone that's naturally quite playful, empathic, curious and accepting. Um, also someone that's quite calm um, because there will be lots of difficult and challenging moments as a key adult. Um, someone who's willing to learn. So I've had to do a lot of learning in my role as a key adult. Um, and someone who's able to work as part of a team. So although you're the key adult supporting that child young person, you're going to be part of a wider network of adults supporting that child or young person. And it's really important that you can lean on and go to and get advice from those other people around the key child. Um, so, I mean, I wouldn't say there are any real expectations. I guess the outcomes, like I mentioned before, you know, when you go in, those are the outcomes you're trying to um, promote for that child but in terms of as yourself as a key adult I think you know as I said those four parts of pace are really important but I think there's lots of people supporting um, children young people that would be more than willing to take on the role of a key adult and that would be brilliant at being a key adult so thank you that's a really nice question and can't see any more questions or I've got one more question here that says, how do you deal with the inconsistencies of how other adults interact with children and young people? And that's a really great question, something that I have come across. Um, it is really difficult when you're trying really hard to approach situations and interact with, situ with children and young people in one way, and there are other um, children and young people that aren't, other sorry, adults that aren't. I think it's just really important to yourself be consistent and you know almost model that in all your interaction, even if that other adult is interacting a different way, if you keep on repeating those interactions of how you want it to be done and how it should be done, then I think it will take a lot of time, but in time, um, adults will pick that up. And then I guess also you know, having a conversation with that child, that adult, sorry, and you know, say, you know, I found it really useful when speaking to this child or dealing with that child by being this or showing this. Um, I think sometimes other adults don't always know. I think, you know, I wouldn't have known before I read about PACE, I wouldn't have known about it. So I think it's about just opening their eyes to other ways to deal with it and 
really promoting how you think that really works and why it really works and almost showing them how well it works. So I think that is a bit of a problem that you can come into, but I think if you just keep at it and stick at it, um, eventually you should be able to bring home other members of staff into um, interacting in the same way with that child or young person. So I think that that's all the questions that I have. I'll give it one more minute so you will come up. I can't see any more. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone who has joined in the webinar. I really do hope it's been informative and you've been able to take something from it that you can use to support children and young people in the future. Um, I think it's a really important time to be thinking about some of these strategies. Um, so if anyone does have any more questions or wants to share any more thoughts, then you can contact me via Twitter. Um, my Twitter handle is at the start of the presentation, but it's at Z2Mu. And I hope you all have a lovely weekend. Take care.